this time at the Spitfire factory. It's October, and as the flying season slows down, pilot Jez is heading off to explore one of the Spitfire's lesser known roles. Where it says T, that's the turpit. Ray meets a veteran pilot who grappled with the naval version of the Spitfire. That's what happens when Seafires hit the barrel. Uh -huh. And the finish line is in sight for their Greek Spitfire restoration. But they're missing one major component. The engines have to be tested to their, to their design limits. It would actually suck you into the propeller. There we are. Peter Monk is not a man to turn his back on a Spitfire in need of his help. And he currently has five restorations on the go but only one needs to be back in the air by the end of the year. MJ755 is a Mark IX built at Castle Bromwich. Her clipped wings, optimal for low altitude operations, have been newly painted with Greek Air Force colors. And she's due back in Greece, ready to fly in just 10 weeks time. We're getting into, into the last, few, last stages of the assembly of the, of the project now. Pretty much all of the components and subcomponents are completed. It's a massive Meccano kit from here, and the more people that, that we can get working on, on different areas or different ends of the, the project, the quicker we'll get it finished. Today, they're preparing the aircraft for the arrival of the engine. The engine bearer is a critical part of the fuselage frame, built by specialist Mark Britnell. I'm assembling all the components of the engine bearer on the jig. Just um, Finished drilling all the holes on the horseshoe assembly here, or the U-frame. And now I'm preparing to fit the uh, front set of tubes, or try to. They've got to be cut to length and everything yet, so uh, I'm just uh, seeing how things line up at the moment. Fortunately for Mark, it's one size fits all. So he's got his own production line running. Well, this is uh, one I made earlier. <laughs> so I'm, I'm manufacturing another uh, engine bear on the jig there. So this is the finished item. All the Merlin's engines are all the same dimensions. These are the front mounting feet for the engine, and these are the rear ones, two holes either side. The engine bearer will be subjected to intense forces, so it needs very strong fasteners. Well, what I've got here is uh, one of the steel ferrules that's been caplated, and that's the tubular rivet before it's fitted. One side, one end of it is uh, like formed in the lathe, and then they're just cut to various lengths. You can just see the the ferrule there and on this one and then the rivet goes through and the other end is turned over with a special tool we've got so you get that sort of um, flared head top bottom. As well as the weight the structure must deal with torque between the engine and propeller. The tubes will be will be actually bending and flexing while it's you know in, in flight. It's like a shock absorber really some of the fittings, the fixtures on one side are thicker and built up more than the other for the torque of the engine. It's very highly unlikely for one of these to fail, but if it goes, if it does, that's it. You know, the engine will just be off on its own. So. <laughs> During a high-speed dogfight manoeuvre, the forces generated within a Spitfire can be colossal. Those forces all pass through frame five, where the engine bearer connects to the fuselage. Massive thrust from the propeller pulls the structure forward. Rotating at up to 1500 RPM, it creates immense torque, twisting the frame. And high-G manoeuvres can more than triple the weight of the three-quarter ton engine. So, how does it all stay in one piece? Amazingly, the engine is attached to the bearer with just eight bolts four on each side. Well, here's the engine mount, actually mounted on the aircraft. Here you've got the uh, actual mounting plates for the feet of the engine. You see the four, two bolts there, going right through. And then the other two, those, you can see the nuts on them, the bolts are under here. And the bearer attaches to frame five with just four. The tapered bolt here goes in from the top. And then it's, you've got the nut on the bottom to draw it in nice and tight and then slip in. The bottom one is very similar. It bolts straight onto the fitting. This is where the actual wing attaches. These are two of the bolts for the wing. And it's just four of those bolts holding it on. It's an extraordinary bit of engineering, 
from over 80 years ago. In the 1930s, RJ Mitchell and his team had no computers, no simulators, and no experience of what modern air combat would involve. Mr. Mitchell's a very clever chap, isn't he? He's designed it like that from the start. I mean, the way the Spitfires all go together, it didn't, it didn't really change from the first to the last. Very clever man. 130 miles away in Gloucestershire, the engine for the Greek Spitfire is also nearly ready. I suppose you've got to start looking at these other little bits, Rob, to finish off on the Greek engine. Um, hoses, isn't it, you were going to have a look at? Peter Watts and his engine restoration team have been working on it for 17 months. We've got the fuel pump on now, then, so... Uh... Pump's on. Uh, we've got to do the... make up the main fuel hose. Yes. Pumped carb. The engine is a Merlin 66, introduced in late 1941, providing improved low-altitude performance. A two-stage supercharger helped produce over 1,700 horsepower. It hasn't been fired up since it last flew in Greece in 1953. So every single part has been tested and either restored or replaced. These engines have got a recommended life of 500 hours. And an overhaul on an engine like this would take approximately 2,000 hours work. There's over 80% that's, uh, that's original. It's lots of little fiddly bits that, are, that have got lost. Peter's pipe fitter, David, has been on the hard end of all those fiddly bits. On this engine, I've mostly been doing parts like these, these pipes here. Each Merlin Mark has got a different amount of pipes that do different jobs. You've got a, a basic set, but then there are little additions to that. Not all of the Merlins will have that coolant pipe or that generator feed oil pipe there. First, you have to source the materials in imperial sizes is preferable rather than metric these days and actually shape them to fit each application, you know. That's one that I've also made um, from scratch, if you will, with the, the end fittings on it from the day. But that's new tube in there and it's been formed and had that little tag soldered onto it. From start to finish, on that coolant pipe there, there's probably a, a week's work maybe sometimes in something like that. And probably the same with that oil pipe as well. It will all culminate in an engine test in a few days' time. A crucial moment for the whole Greek Spitfire project. Are you all familiar with what these are? Do you all know what they are? Merlin, Merlin engines. Correct. In my humble opinion, this is the aircraft engine that won the Second World War. But the Merlin started life with a serious flaw. There's a carburetor down the bottom, and the carburetor does have a little bit of a weakness. We've all seen the Battle of Britain film, haven't we? Yes, I hope we have. When he does the victory roll at the start of the film, you hear the engine go, <coughs> it coughs as it's inverted. That is a problem. The Germans knew that. It was a flaw that could have lost the Battle of Britain. So what they would do is try and get us to go into a negative G dive. We would attempt to follow them, and what would happen is we'd get starvation of fuel, then saturation of fuel. And unfortunately, that is not good in combat. So we had to come out with a solution, and we did. Now, looking on the tour, we've got a couple of ladies. It's quite rare that we get ladies. I've got, I don't know what it is. You should be very proud, because the, actually the lady who came out with a solution was a lady called Beatrice Schilling, or Tilly Schilling. In Farnborough, Spitfire historian Paul Beaver is at an event to celebrate Tilly Schilling's life and achievements. I think this is a really amazing event. Um, you've got somebody that only the real aficionados of the Spitfire have ever heard of. We're here because of Tilly Schilling, Beatrice Schilling, a female engineer, in itself an amazingly unusual thing in the 1930s. She is really one of the great icons of aviation. Beatrice Schilling joined the Royal Aircraft Establishment as a science officer in 1936 and worked there until 1969. So it's with immense pleasure that I have been invited to unveil this plaque in appreciation of this formidable woman.
there's a simple maneuver that the Germans carried out in the Battle of Britain to escape Spitfires and sometimes hurricanes, and that's by bunting the aeroplane. The bunting the aeroplane is to let it drop, so you go to negative G. The British fighters couldn't do the same maneuver without the engine stalling, so they had to roll the aircraft and chase the fuel-injected Messerschmitts, and that lost them the advantage. They needed a way to control the fuel flow when the engine was upside down. So a very simple piece of elegant engineering, no bigger than my thumbnail, gets fitted into the carburetta. Tilly's solution was a simple washer to restrict the fuel flow during negative G so the engine wouldn't stall. She took a team of, of, of engineers around, a lot of them were women, they went to every air station and they they modified the aircraft, they just took the carburetors to pieces. The next morning, the pilots had the ability to outfly the Messerschmitt 109. There was a downside, I'm afraid to say, ladies, the, the gentleman gave it a nickname. And the nickname was Mrs. Schilling's Orifice. But if she had have done that, there's no question about it, we would have lost more pilots. No question about it at all. So God bless Mrs. Schilling and our Orifice. I'm sure there were people working on really complex solutions but that wasn't Tilly Schilling. Her idea in life was to make it really simple. An elusive character, Tilly is remembered fondly by her goddaughter, Judy. So what was it like to be Tilly Schilling's goddaughter? Um, Auntie B, you mean. Ah, so she wasn't Tilly to you? No, not never heard anybody call her Tilly. What was she like to have as a, as a godmother? She was this lady thick corduroy trousers, a man shirt, cigarette on the go all the time. Did, did she ever try and encourage you to, to go into engineering? Not specifically. She used to buy me things like chemistry sets and microscopes and things like that and, you know, child's versions of them. Yes. But she also bought me the only teddy bear I ever had as well. I think she should be a household name, really. Exactly. Um, and she isn't because yes. she didn't suffer fools gladly. Yes. And well, there were a lot of fools around. The Merlin went on to become a war-winning success. But the days of costing a few pennies to keep them flying are long gone. We're looking now roughly about £135,000 per engine. Then you run them, you inspect them on 25 hours, 50, 75, 100. So we're talking at least a quarter of a million pounds just to run the aircraft over 500 hours. Looks like it's time for Peter to get his wallet out. Yeah, it's Friday morning and uh, just getting Leon ready to get him out the door. He's always late. Bye. Bye. Yeah, have a good day, Leon. It's a big day for Peter Monk, but he's not going into the hangar. A chance, perhaps, to prove he can be a hands-off boss. We've got five projects on the go at the moment and these projects are costing millions of pounds. That's an awful lot of money. That's life-changing money for, for most people. So we're proud that, uh, that we always perform and, and, uh, and uh, meet our deadlines, but we are reliant upon others. Hmm. What are you watching, Peter? So where's Joe? Not so hands-off after all. I've got here access to our uh, security cameras at the hangar, and um, I'll always have a look, see what's going on. If I'm not at the hangar, then it's, it's just a way for me to stay in touch. I'm looking at the progress this morning on the Greek Spitfire. Franco is working underneath the wing, fitting a radiator. Paul Ader is working on the other side of the aircraft, fitting the wing fairings. He'd be lost without Spitfires. He could never retire. He's never going to retire. He'd be still running the hangar. The Zimmer frame. Spy cam checkup complete. Peter's off to Gloucestershire, where his precious Greek Spitfire engine has been strapped onto the back of a truck. We've got an engine on fitted to our uh, Merlin test rig. It's, it's, a, it's a lorry that we've uh, converted to be able to uh, test an engine on it. It may look a bit Heath Robinson, but this truck is a fully equipped mobile Merlin test rig. This is the only test rig that I'm aware of in the UK that's capable of test, fully testing a Merlin. But they're not going to fire up a 1,700 horsepower engine in this small hangar. They're at a local airfield, and Peter's here hoping to sign off on the rebuild. It's just a final run today. 
and I'll just come down and just to witness that, have a look, and uh, if I'm happy with it, I'll accept it, and then it will be delivered to Biggin Hill as soon as possible, and the aeroplane's waiting for it. After the test run, I'll just be having a look round, having a look at the exhaust pipes to make sure that the mixture's as it should be, which we can tell quite quickly, and just looking round for leaks. Once in position, the truck needs to be secured. I'm just putting the support arm on. Uh, counteract the torque reaction, stabilise the lorry. The Merlin has almost 10 times the power of the truck's own engine. Putting on the handbrake wouldn't work. They have to be sure it won't literally take off. It could turn the lorry onto its side. Or worse. It would actually suck you into the propeller. Jerry and I are going to be looking for any, anything untowards with the engine. And we're standing well back throughout the way of the propeller. The engines have to be tested to their, to their design limit, so the test program that Retro use is exactly as, the, as was used um, during the war, when the engines were to be used to their maximum. David will run the test from the control room, a.k.a. the cab. This is our uh, Merlin engine test procedure. Uh, a good representation of the sort of uh, pass-off tests that have been carried out um, at the factory in period. Control we have here, um, fairly good um, replication of what you'd have in the aircraft um, with some additional uh, gauges as well. We've got the propeller pitch control, uh, engine throttle, magneto switches, engine RPM, um, engine boost pressure. It's the moment of truth. Clear prop. Warm up so we see a minimum of uh, 50 degrees water temperature and 15 degrees oil temperature. So I'll take it up to 2,000 zero boost, um, drop out uh, each individual magneto. 1,200 horsepower. Ear defenders on, chocks are holding, and maximum power. Oh, nothing's falling off. They just come down from max cruise, maximum uh, load that you can run the engine for continuously. Right, I'll uh, shut it down then. So, a bit tad, lean on idling, high. perhaps. Mm. A bit crackly. No rise tad, on shutdown. Tad, tad high on the idle speed. Yep. We can check the inside of the exhaust stubs to see that the, we've got the correct mixture and it's all good. A bit of fine tuning to do, but Peter's a happy customer. Nice to be able to see that it, that it will handle it safely here on a rig on the ground. Okay. So are you going to deliver the engine up, are you? Yes. yes. Oh, you will? We'll see you next week then. This Merlin 66 is on its way to be reunited with its Spitfire. Merlin engines doubled in power over the course of the war, and the Spitfire also evolved as its roles changed. Ground Crew Chief Ray has been researching one of its lesser-known incarnations. And he's heading off to meet a veteran that flew one. I'm going to meet um, an ex-fleet air arm pilot from World War II. His name is uh, Keith Quilter. Now 97, Keith joined up as a Navy pilot in 1942, served in the Atlantic and Pacific Wars, and survived two kamikaze attacks. Oh, hello, Ray. How are you, Keith? Okay, just about on time. Ray's keen to hear about his experiences with a naval version of the Spitfire. We had no really decent uh, carrier-borne aircraft when the war started. Mm. Because we were so short, we were asked both uh, Hawkers and Supermarine to provide us with converted land fighters. So we had a Sea Hurricane and a Sea Spitfire, which was called the Seafire. 
The Navy wanted the Spitfire's abilities as a fighter, but the early versions weren't well suited to life on an aircraft carrier. Now, everything I've read about the Seafire was it's a Spitfire with an arrestor hook, and that sounds like that's got problems. The problem was um, it, it had all the fighter characteristics which we needed off aircraft carriers, but it was very difficult to actually land on the carrier because the poor visibility mm. from the cockpit. You needed to be able to see a batsman on the end of the carrier who was guiding you in and could um, give you uh, appropriate signals to take account of the movement of the end of the carrier. It's like the end of the runway going up and down or mm. twisting side to side. And you, if you have the right speed and the right um, situation in relative to the deck, you touch down in a few feet and hopefully catch a wire with your mm. arrestor hook. Mm. Ironically, the Spitfire's aerodynamic design made catching a wire especially challenging. Because it was such an aerodynamically perfect aeroplane, instead of dropping directly on the deck, it would float just above the wires right. and the hook would be just above the wires yeah. and it would be into the barrier. You're trying to catch a few wires that are oh, laid know. across the deck. And if you don't catch that, you're gonna go straight on and you're gonna go, you're gonna have an accident. It might be fatal, you might yeah. walk away with it, you don't know. Keith witnessed more than one disastrous landing. There's a sea fire coming into land. Ah. But you can see the hook look. Right yeah, down it's a there. huge, great big and, and the batsman's gone like So that. he's he's telling you to cut power there, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Oh, That's what happens when seafires hit the barrier. Uh -huh. That he's just going into the barrier there. Right. So he's he's arrestor hooks missed, basically. There's the first barrier, he's gone into the second barrier. Good grief. This one's caught, you can see the arrestor while he's caught. Got look, it. There. Yeah. But he's yeah. still he got it too late. He's still gone just into this barrier. Yeah. He's going over the side, this one, look, see? I mean, look at that. Sometimes the aircraft would hang over the side, it would caught a wire, and the aircraft skewed, went over the side, but was still hanging on the rest of wire. So you're hanging a few feet That's above the sea, with the ship That's going about yeah. 30 knots. Yeah. <laughs> and then after a while, the hook gives way, and then you're in the sea. Keith managed to avoid such problems most of the time. The most damage I ever did to an aircraft landing on a carrier. I burst the starboard tyre on an occasion when I was well over the drink drive limit <laughs> and I was landing into the midnight sun, which was in our tyre. And the way that came about... So the sun was the problem, not, not the over the limit bit. It was the sun in your eyes was the problem bit. Of Keith, course. Wasn't it? Of course yeah. it was, yeah. From these troubled beginnings, the sea fire evolved with hydraulically powered folding wings, contra-rotating propellers, and a top speed of over 450 miles an hour. The Mark 47 was the most advanced type of Spitfire ever made, and it was still in service alongside the new jet fighters of the Korean War. Once airborne, with the, with the um, teardrop canopy. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, and once you were up, yeah, it was a lovely aeroplane to fly. It's November the 5th, but Franco probably won't be thinking about fireworks today because his Christmas has come early. Look at that, isn't that fantastic? Isn't that brilliant? It's such a lovely looking engine. I mean, there's nothing more than a Spitfire than its engine. I mean, it's the heart of the actual aircraft, isn't it? You know, I mean, just look at it. That engine came out of that aircraft. That's its original 66, Merlin 66, that's actually going back into it. So you, you can't get better than that. Franco's taking a few moments to enjoy his new toy before he has to let the team get their hands on it. Quite a lot of the connections are all wire locked. The way the wire's made out is to stop it from undoing. So if it was ever to vibrate loose, it wouldn't actually come loose. If that was to become slack, this wire wouldn't allow it to undo totally. See, it's locked by this one. And that would have been done during the war, as in as basically aviation standards. Right, let's get it unloaded, I suppose. Hey, 
There you go, that was its first flight. <laughs> Now, he's going to have to share it. Inside the hangar, preparations are underway to install the engine. But before you bolt a three-quarter tonne engine onto the front of a Spitfire, some precautions are advised. What we're doing is we're tying the back end of the aircraft down and we don't want any weight issues. Like we put the engine in the next minute the tail goes up, so we always have this massive concrete block here tied to the the block weighs a third of a tonne. They've got one big job to bolt the engine on, and then dozens of little ones to install all the systems that connect to it. That's it. See, so what we're trying to do is get this right down the middle, with the beam down the middle, and then pick it up, and then just push it. Start lifting a stand up soon. Mm. What we'll do is just put the gear up and bring it down a bit. They have to move very carefully. This is not a good moment to destroy months of expensive restoration work. There you are. Easy does it. They really don't roll nicely, those wheels. Am I right on the supercharger really? casing on your side, Tony? Right. Now down or back? No, we've got to go back. We've got to come back. back. To go come uh, back. Uh, right. <laughs> Eight bolt holes need to be perfectly lined up. We need to go back further to go down. Right. So we're having to drop it, push it back, drop it, okay. push it back. We need to come back another two inches at least. You ain't got two inches. It's a tight squeeze at the back where lots of components have been installed on the firewall. I'll take this pipe off. There's one small part blocking their progress. This banjo pipe is in the way. Yeah, except that's real, is it? Right, hold it there. Banjo pipe removed. And the Leviathan edges closer. Hold it there. And again. That's it. It's there. These are aluminium points and this is a steel point, a vault, so it just basically stops any corrosion between them happening. All eight bolts are in. It's on. That's all right, then? Yeah. Perfect. T broke. That's the one big job done. Now the real work can begin with dozens of pipes, cables and electrics to install. We'll head out east towards Dover. Yeah. So then I can just talk to you and, and also give you a chance to get your hands on the controls if you, if you want to. Looking forward to it. Good, OK. The Spitfire took on many different roles during World War II. And pilot Jez Britcher has a special interest in one of them. Chocks out. When he's not flying Spitfires for paying customers, he's a reconnaissance pilot, monitoring shipping lanes around the UK. Today, he's come to the Military Intelligence Museum in Bedfordshire to find out more about how Spitfires were used for reconnaissance. It all began with an Australian pilot who had a plan. This gentleman, Sidney Cotton, was fundamental in setting this whole thing up, photographic reconnaissance in the Second World War. He was a most unusual character, he was an engineer, he was an inventor, he had a brilliant mind. Cotton had secretly photographed German military activity before the outbreak of war. And in 1939, he tried to convince the RAF to give him some of their latest planes for a reconnaissance role. Now, of course, the Spitfire had just come into production at that time, and they were slowly becoming available. But Fighter Command was yeah, scrabbling for every course. single one. So Sydney asking imagine. to use a Spitfire yes, was probably absolutely yeah. the People, last thing they wanted. Eventually, he did get two Spitfires. Mm. 
and the work began to convert yeah. two fighter Spitfires into two photoreconnaissance Spitfires. For long distance flights, the Spitfires were painted blue and stripped of armaments to make room for cameras and extra fuel tanks. The plan was that the Spitfires would operate between 30 and 35,000, maybe up to 40,000 feet. The pilot would be on oxygen throughout, yeah, it throughout had to be the at flight. That altitude, had to be, be that's right. Bitterly cold. You could be talking minus 50, Absolutely. 60. Yeah, yeah, it would be. And you're going up there and thinking, I've got no ammunition here, I've got no guns. That's right. The only thing I've got in my favour is the fact that yes. I'm perhaps higher than these other guys. Yes. And I can potentially outrun them if they yes. did get up if, to my altitude. Yes, if there was trouble. Yes, that's and right. Yes. That must, in your yes. mind, must be quite difficult to go off and do. It was, I think, a special mindset that was needed. Yeah. You were on your own. For hours. They, they were lone wolves. They really did go on their own. Over a thousand photo interpreters were recruited to analyse the photographs and trained to identify ships ammunition dumps and missile sites. One of their biggest challenges of the war was preparing the landing forces for D-Day. Every landing craft commander had a map and had photographs of the exact landing place where that landing craft was going to go. And the same when they got on shore, they would have the map and photographs telling them exactly where to go. Mm. And this took an awful lot of putting together. And of course, further behind, uh, surveying the, the countryside behind that they would have to cover, to go through in the advance. There was a lot of planning went into Extremely this Extremely important information. Oh, absolutely crucial. They yeah. couldn't have, yeah. have done it without. At the same time, the unit was tracking the Germans' largest battleship, the Tirpitz, which was trying to hide in the Norwegian fjords. It was a serious threat to the convoys particularly. There was a desperate need to know where this ship was at any time. These are stereo images and you view them through a stereo viewer. That's you might have... No, I can, yeah. You can see every fine detail, <laughs> yes. like all the guns on, yes. the, on the deck and everything. It's That's right. absolutely amazing. The Tirpitz was monitored throughout the war with lone recon pilots risking their necks day after day. Jane Cusson's father was one of them. This is my, my father, his, that's him, squadron leader. Mm -hmm. And this is sitting on the... his chums around him. He's got the flat cap. Um, and this is on the little blue Spitfire. Five hours, 55. That's a long time to be in a Spitfire. Yeah. I mean, I quite regularly do an hour at one time in a Spitfire, but to sit in there for five, nearly six hours, well, six hours, really, yes. six hours, it's yeah. absolutely fatiguing, it's incredibly noisy. Yeah. And for, obviously, your father, he was up at high altitudes, so freezing cold. He would have had back pains, leg pains, all those things associated with long, long time sitting in one yeah. position. <laughs> so, I mean, I do not envy what he did. No. And this is the album of his reconnaissance photos. So it's one of the photos that my father took of the Norwegian fjords when they were looking for the Tirpitz. So this is Trondheim Fjord and it's April 1942, where it says T, that's the Tirpitz. Mm. It's yeah. almost impossible. Can, it just blends in, doesn't it, with, yep. the, with the snowy environment that's in. So that would have been rushed back mm. and then somebody would have been able to identify that, maybe my mother, who mm. knows, yeah. as being the Tirpitz. Jane's mother, Diana, was a photo interpreter. It was one of several wartime marriages between pilot and interpreter. What do you think made your mother a particularly good photographic interpreter? Uh, well, she always used to say, attention to detail and a curiosity. Mm, I think that's it. Um, so that she would look at something through the stereoscope and think, hmm, what's that? That looks a funny little novel mm. there. What is that? Or, that's a weird little thing. That wasn't there yesterday. The days of the Tirpitz were numbered. And one pilot who benefited from the work of the reconnaissance team was Keith Quilter. In 1944, Keith took part in one of the largest aerial assaults on the Tirpitz, Operation Goodwood. He flew one of over 40 carrier-based fighters and bombers that attacked the fjords. They failed to sink her but it was a decisive moment. I think we could claim that we stopped her going out, mm. because you wouldn't want to go out when you knew it was a carrier task force in no. the area. No. Because we stopped her going out, Hitler got so fed up with his bloody great battleship that he got the did nothing. Doing nothing, yeah. He um, ordered her to move a bit further south. And when the Tirpitz moved south, 
she came within range of Lancaster bombers based in Scotland. Flying between 13,000 and 16,000 feet, each of the 29 Lancasters loses a six-ton earthquake bomb. The German battleship is hit at her bow, amidships, and toward the stern. Her guns are silenced, and the Tirpitz is again covered by smoke, this time from flames that seal her doom. But Keith's war was far from over. In 1945, he was posted to the Pacific to help the Americans who were closing in on mainland Japan. So you were literally marauding your way across the whole of Japan at that yeah. point? Nobody ever heard of it. No. We were the only pilots that flew British roundels over Japan. Right. Nobody's ever heard of it. Here, Keith experienced a terrifying new form of attack. They call it kamikaze, meaning the divine tempest. We call them suicide planes. Their destination, the deck or hull of any American ship under which plane bombed, burning gasoline, and red sight pilot can crash. Sixteen-year-olds, still in aviation school. It was a maniacal, all-out effort to smash our sea power. On the 4th of May, 1945, Keith was stationed on the British aircraft carrier HMS Formidable off the coast of Japan. So that's formidable. There's a kamikaze. So that's loaded with high explosives. So the guy is going to take that into what he thinks is the most vulnerable point of the carrier. And that's the impact going on there. What on earth must that have felt I was like? down in my cabin putting my flying gear on. <laughs> I believe it says that there were seven killed and 42 wounded. There's a description from one guy from Victorious who's looking across the formidable saying he couldn't understand how on earth anyone survived that. A few days after the first attack, Keith's carrier was attacked again. Later on, we learned to wave a great big red flag off the side of the island to take, for take cover if, if any engines were running on the flight deck. Right. I had my flight. Uh, at instant readiness, we were all strapped in our cockpits and we started the engines about every half hour to make sure that we got warm engines and may, they could fly us off at a moment's notice if necessary. When this red flag was waved, so I switched off, untipped the straps, got out of the Corsair and down about three decks before it hit us the second time. And so did everybody else on the flight mm, deck. Mm. And although it damaged quite a few of our aircraft, um, Killed very few. It killed far fewer people. Yeah. Keith was eventually shot down during an attack on a Japanese harbour. But even then, his luck didn't run out. I ditched somewhere between that island and the mainland Got it. there. But we were told that if you don't think you can get back to the fleet, get as far away from the coast as you can. So having ditched in here, That's not very I was far, paddling as hard as I could get out in my little dinghy. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine, when this submarine came in on the surface, steaming straight into the harbour, it didn't occur to me it was an American. I, so the, 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 I thought it must be a Jap so submarine. The Americans actually came in that close They came in that come close. And get you. Yeah. I mean, how good's that? Yeah, amazing. Absolutely amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. Keith was still on board that submarine when the second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and the war ended. So, dare I ask, Keith, that's you, um, how many of you guys survived that from that photo? He was killed, he was killed. Um, he was killed. Um, I think it was him killed by the kamikaze. He was on deck. He, he was killed on the turpid strike. Good grief. Um, killed, killed, killed. I think that's the lot. Bloody old <laughs> Keith. <laughs> That's about two thirds. That's 16 out of 18. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're either dead or um, out of action. It's horrendous, isn't it? Um, it it staggers me. You had to keep all this suppressed somehow. Mm. If, if you dwelt on it, you got the twitch. Yeah. Over 5,000 British servicemen were killed in Asia and the Pacific. Keith was one of the lucky ones. When the war was all over, I'd been shot down. I'd lived through it, didn't get captured. Um, it suddenly occurred to me, I know where I'm going. Yeah. There's wow. no doubt. 
I know I'm going to get home. And it suddenly um, became obvious how much I'd had to suppress all those sort of thoughts previously, that uh, the need to, um, and it was nothing to worry about mm. anymore. Mm. It, it, it was an odd feeling. Thanks very much for coming. It's, I hope, it's, been, hope a, it's been a pleasure. And and you want to. I have to say, Keith, it's been an absolute privilege. The thing that still irritates me rather, especially when I think of the number of, of our um, fellows who did not come back, the thing that hurts most is that we are not known. I don't think we were all that wonderful. We weren't like the Battle of Britain chaps or the D-Day chaps who had to land on the beaches. But, it, but, we were, but nobody had ever even heard of us. And we were the only British aircraft flying over mainland Japan. And nobody's ever heard of us. Back at Biggin Hill, one week after the arrival of the engine, installation is well underway. And Peter's checking on progress. So we've put the propeller governor on. This is a pump which, which varies the pitch of the propeller to maintain the constant speed uh, of rotation of the engine. Very critical item on the aircraft. We've got this side here, we've got the, the vacuum pump. And this drives the, um, the uh, gyro instruments, or the gyroscopic instruments, all driven by this. The installation of the engine entails connecting literally dozens of components and systems that serve the engine, monitor the engine, or are powered by it, including the fuel supply, the cooling system, the hydraulics, and pneumatics. On here, we've attached the coolant header tank. That is where the coolant goes, just like you pour, put coolant into a car. For the cooling purposes, this aircraft has exactly uh, uh, the same uh, system, where it uses radiators to, to keep the core of the engine cool. And now we're installing the pipes. These are quite large pipes, which allow low pressure, but high flow, down to the radiators, which we've already got installed, which are under the wings. But this item here, this is the compressor. Now, the most important thing that this uh, supplies is the air for the brakes. Other thing it operates is flaps. Here, just below the compressor, we've got the um, magneto. So the magneto supplies high tension electricity to generate spark at, um, for one set of spark plugs on each side of the engine. And almost all of these components are originals. When we look in the cockpit, we see the original rudder pedals. The wear on those rudder pedals would have been by George, George Dunn that delivered the thing in the, back in the 40s. His feet would have been on those very pedals, the control column, the undercarriage selector, the handle on the throttle. So, yeah, it's very important, very unique. Satisfied with the progress, Peter takes some photos to show the owners in Greece. There's now just seven weeks to go until the deadline. And Peter's throwing everyone he can at the job to get it done. We've got six guys working on it, not necessarily all around the aircraft. There's a couple of bits being painted in the paint shop. We've got guys working underneath the aircraft, in the aircraft, beside the aircraft. After nearly two years of work, it's been a huge leap forward for the project. Next comes the propeller, and then they can start her up.